that should be it, yes. So thank you very much for um, coming to the Center World Christianity on this um, one of the very last days before uh, Christmas, before the, the Western Christmas. Um, it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce um, uh, Dr. Marinos Chidioke uh, Iwuchukwu, uh, who is going to speak to us today uh, about a, um, a theological uh, discourse, which uh, we, we can then uh, discuss inclusive religious pluralism in the beliefs and practices, so theology and phenomenology of religions of the world and interreligious dialogue. So th this is essentially as global and as um, world uh, Christian as uh, a topic can become. So I'm um, extremely grateful that we that we have this opportunity. Uh, just uh, a few words to uh, the speaker uh, himself. He's associate professor in theology uh, at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, United States. Received his um, uh, doctorate in uh, uh, theology and society, um, uh, or systemic systematic theology from Marquette University in uh, Milwaukee, um, and his uh, areas of research include interreligious dialogue, including religious pluralism, world religions, media and religious studies. He has published widely, including two books, and also edited another book. And the most recent monograph is called Muslim Christian Dialogue in Postcolonial Northern Nigeria. Uh, this is certainly something which is very much at the heart of uh, our own endeavors here at SOAS. And I'm therefore very glad that uh, you are able to present uh, to us today. So I'm going to pass uh, the word to our speaker, uh, Marinus uh, Ibuchukwu. If you could please start with the um, with the uh, presentation and we'll be joining you in the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. Um, good afternoon to my audience at SOARS, uh, my main audience, and to my colleagues and friends in the United States, good morning. Uh, this is, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to share my thoughts on this monograph, um, which I have been working on, actually spent this semester at um, the University of Chester, um, where I did my sabbatical, working more on this text. And uh, I've tried to share my thoughts with scholars uh, and uh, people who would be kind enough to provide me feedback. Uh, so I'm really, really appreciative to the uh, head of the School of History, Religions, and Philosophies, Professor Ayman Shihadeh, who, whom I contacted, and he graciously um, uh, agrees to have this work shared in, with the uh, faculty and students of um, SOAS. And uh, Lars and Romina have coordinated this event. Uh, so I appreciate you guys, because you've been so effective in uh, ensuring that um, we we are on, on spot with this. Uh, uh, fortunately, we are doing this three weeks later than we had planned because of the strike you guys had there in, uh, at, at London. Um, but I, I still appreciate those of you who, may, who are making time at these late hours of the semester with all your plans to be part of this uh, lecture. Uh, I, will, I will read much of what I have, and um, then we can share thoughts after that um, during this Q&A. Uh, um, and uh, Rimina is uh, queuing my, my, uh, my PowerPoint. So yeah, so here we go, the introduction. Uh, today, Peaceful social and political relationships globally are inextricably hinged on peaceful relationship between people of different religious faiths living side by side each other across the globe. Um, this fact is not only contingent on the fact that despite intensive efforts of secularization and anti-religious ideologies that earnestly began with the age of enlightenment, 
an overwhelmingly dominant percentage of global human population still identify with one religion or the other. Um, a recent poll um, by World Population Review statistics shows that about 85% of the world population uh, identify with one religion or the other today. Uh, in addition, but also because uh, several of the world religions continue to heavily invest on global proselytization. There's a growing number of societies today uh, that are home to diverse religions. The Human Rights Charter, uh, the UN Human Rights Charter firmly endorses the freedom of religion and followers of different religions are either engaged in an ending conflict with each other or are pestering social, serious social disorder in different parts of the world. For these and many more reasons, we cannot ignore religion today in our society. Um, the subdiscipline of theology of religions, which is relatively new in the uh, theological academy, was inaugurated largely by Christian theologians. The main discourse of theology of religions in Christianity was ignited by the search for theological response to what happens to the souls of the largest segment of human population who are not Christians and who may not convert to Christianity by the time of their death. With a growing active encounter of Christians with peoples of other religious traditions and the appreciation of the values inherent in those religions, it was becoming obvious to any logical minded Christian that God would not snub or condemn such large group of his beloved creatures to perdition simply because of the accidents of birth and geography. Because it was obvious that most of these people who had no choice, or most of these people had no choice uh, or chance of becoming Christians owing to the place and time of their birth. We can still stick to the first, uh, the, the first, uh, yeah. Yeah, therefore, on the question of salvation of non-Christian peoples, Christian theologians and leaders have responded with, oh, I'm sorry, can I back up? Yeah. Oh, um, the growing number of societies today have, be have become home to many religions, like I said. Um, the inextricable link of peace in society with peace among religions is succinctly stated by Hans Kuhn, who said, there can be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. Next slide, please. Next slide. Therefore, on the question of salvation of non-Christians, people, Christian theologians and leaders have responded with different theological paradigms. At some point and for centuries, most Christians were in favor of exclusive, exclusivism. However, especially from the 20th century, there began strong leaning toward inclusivism. And today we find a good section of Christians who advocate and are open to pluralism. Pope John Paul II weighed in severally on the subject. In his address in 1990 to the assembly of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, he stated much carefully the much careful theological investigation still has to be done regarding the relation between the church and other religions. The question of how God accomplishes the salvation of all, all those who call upon him through the unique mediation of Christ is one which demands the continued attention of the church. Likewise, the work of the spirit of Christ in the members of other religions, unquote. While the Roman Catholic Church has invested some of our energy to respond to the concerns raised by John Paul II, several Christian scholars, both Catholic and Protestants, had earlier delved into the question of the salvation of non-Christians with varying responses. From the Catholic Resource More movement, also but pejoratively known as the Nouvelle uh, Theology, which started in France in the middle of the 1920s, Theologians of both Catholic and Protestant faiths had broached this topic and came up with several conclusions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scholars of this movement and succeeding periods after 
we are beginning to let go of the old theological mindset of limiting salvation to only bona fide Christians. So scholars like Marie Dominique Chenou, Henry de Lubeck, Yves Conger, Paul Bach, Jean Danielou, Hans O. van Bartosar, Henry Boyard, Edward Skillebex, Tarana, and Portillic, among a long list of others. Now, the growth of new ways to understand and articulate the big question of salvation eventually led to the identification of several paradigms, several theological paradigms or mothers of theology of religions. Of the three typologies in theology of religions, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism, pluralism is widely recognized as the most appropriate model, especially in the 21st century, in the growing normative, culturally and religiously diverse societies and by those in favor of postmodern approach to religion. In his opening statements about religious pluralism, Perry Schmidt Loco had stated, and I quote, people have never ever been more aware of the actual extent of this existential diversity than today. Well, from my perspective, uh, unquote, from my perspective as a member of a cultural minority who has lived side by side with multiple religious minorities, Schmidt Local appears to suggest that diversity suddenly came upon us today. Whereas the more existential accurate narrative should be that because of the growing resistance to marginalization and oppression by minority groups, we are compelled today to respect and acknowledge both cultural and religious diversities that have been with the, been the human experience since we as humans started encountering each other. Now the objective of my study include the desire for all people of faith to appreciate the core theological and phenomenological foundations for inclusive religious pluralism and to promote meaningful interreligious dialogue with people of other faith traditions in the world. While accepting Alan Ray's now popular three paradigms, this study has chosen to acknowledge the already existing diversity or hybridity in the understanding, application, and conception of pluralism. Therefore, this study is doing some of what um, J. Abraham Valles de la Cia underscored as a combination of each of the three paradigms with others in multiple ways. The Latia reason that you can have someone who theologically holds an exclusivist theology, but in real life practices inclusivism in their relationship with people of other faith traditions. So according to him, you can then have different hybrids of the paradigms like exclusive pluralist, exclusive inclusivist, inclusive pluralist or pluralistic inclusivist, and so on and on. As a scholar of theology of religion, I maintain that the three typologies, basic typologies which Reis um, has shared with us should remain fundamental for this theological taxonomy with provision for hybrid appropriate typologies. Therefore, in this study, I will focus largely on exploring both the normative use of the term pluralism from the perspective of Hick, um, there's a John Hick, uh, Tantwa Smith and their associates as well as reappropriate the term in the light of my preference for the hybrid inclusive pluralism. I will also highlight some of the facts that make this term operable and valid in the theological discourse of Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and some indigenous religions. Next slide, please. Inclusive religious pluralism paradigm and interreligious dialogue. While there may be differing understanding of pluralism among different scholars, there's a consensus among pluralist theologians and scholars that religious pluralism recognizes and respects the legitimacy of different religions in the society. And secondly, most theologians and religion scholars understand pluralism not just as expression of diversity, but as a particular interpretation of religious diversity. Jack Dupuy strongly suggests 
that the most appropriate way for a Christian to resonate with the concept of religious pluralism is to interpret the existing religious diversity as an inclusive religious pluralism. This study was conceived on the understanding that inclusive religious pluralism has a philosophy and theology that resonates wider than just Christian worldview. One of the overarching intents, intents of this study is to avail people of other world religions to take ownership of the concepts and creatively adapt and apply the concepts from their varying theological perspectives. The main argument of this work underscores the necessity for adopting inclusive pluralism toward effective interreligious dialogue using core theological underpinnings of different world religions. So the epistemology of religious pluralism has become normatively identified with John Hick and with Fred Cantor Smith's definition and description. Consequently, especially in the theological and religious ambience, theologians who object to the definition of Hick and his allies have tended to qualify their use of an understanding of religious pluralism. At a philosophical or social ideological parlance, the use of the word has also often been qualified to avoid the oversimplification of the word, which becomes associated with, with relativism or liberal extreme of permissiveness. Stewart, Siepo, and Hoover highlight these concerns in this quote, which you see on the, uh, in the PowerPoint. And they say, an argument for pluralism must immediately confront a significant terminological problem. Namely, in the context of religion today, the word pluralism is most often used in ways that are synonymous with relativism. In both scholarly and popular discourse, when pluralism is invoked without specific qualifiers, the default meaning usually attributed to the word is that of relativism, unquote. Next slide. So it is precisely based on the concerns expressed by above authors that it is imperative to identify the appropriate form of pluralism one advocates for religions today. Inclusive religious pluralism is a descriptive term for the pluralism which I and some other scholars advocate that religions should adopt in our postmodern world, especially to reflect our need today for sustainable and effective interreligious dialogue and interreligious relations. Inclusive religious pluralism as a paradigm mitigates against the so called imperialism labeled against inclusivism and the relativism alleged against pluralism. J. Abraham de la, de, de la, Cia, de la de Cia, provides a summary of the root of the term as follows in his quote, uh, which you have on the PowerPoint. He says, pluralistic inclusivism originated as a reaction to the insufficient openness of inclusivism and the excessive openness of pluralism, unquote. It accommodates the best of both inclusive inclusivity and pluralism as composite worldviews necessary for today's diverse religious societies. It is the understanding from a monotheistic religious perspective that as creatures of God, we humans originate from the same source with variety of potentials and diverse uniqueness. Therefore, we share a lot of similarities as well as differences. These phenomenological facts and theological understanding from the bedrock of include form the bedrock of inclu inclusivism. The choice of the theology of inclusive religious pluralism in this study is in concurrence with, with Stuart, Sipro, and Hoover, who state, uh, and the quote is also on your PowerPoint. It says, it is useful to attach, attach a modifier to the word pluralism that signals clearly from the outset that what is intended is something distinctly richer are more engaged than casually relativistic tolerance. In his review of, is there only one true religion or are there many? Uh, Schubert Ogden's book, Paul J. Griffiths opines that the appropriate theology of religions to be held by Christians is the pluralistic inclusivism, which Ogden was advocating, advocating in his book. In affirming the validity of pluralistic inclusivism, which is a 
the same as inclusive pluralism, Griffith states, as you see on the, on the PowerPoint, he says, Christians had better assent to the model, model claim of pluralistic inclusivism. The claim that it is possible that there are many true religions, quote, erat demonstrandum, unquote. As Griffiths rightly argued in his review of Ogden's book, Christian theology of religions is largely based on a priori conclusion, as we are not privileged to undertake a, a posteriori uh, analysis of our religions. Based on, on such a priori analysis alone, it is not sufficient to conclude about other religions without absolute certainty. Nonetheless, in the light of the empirical evidence of other world religions, it flies contrary to facts available for Christians to continue to insist on the claim that Christianity is only true religion. Next slide. Now, the impacts of globalization Postmodernity, postmodernism, and immigration have unquestionably expanded human communities beyond the confines of their original territorial, religious, and ideological frameworks. The advocacy and drift toward effective interreligious dialogue going on across the globe between major religions have intensified. It has become somewhat anachronistic to validate monoculturalism and religious exclusivism as the acceptable order in pluralistic societies today. We currently know the struggles and difficulties going on in Afghanistan um, where such exclusivism is dominant. It is also becoming increasingly unacceptable to ignore, deny, or demean the existence of the religious order in many pluralistic societies today. Among the many obstacles to effective interreligious dialogue between people of different faith traditions across the globe is a resistance to efforts of genuine dialogue by strong believers in either exclusivism or inclusivism. So Jacques Dupuy advocated that Christians approach dialogue bearing in mind religious pluralism is not just a de facto reality, but also the ure of God's relationship with our people. This second aspect of pluralism, that religions are the ure, they are part of God's principle, has been very difficult for many, for some as Christians especially, to uh, embrace. And that's kind of what we're trying to um, argue in, 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 in this research, in this study. Although some religions, religious people are reluctant to appreciate the ure religious pluralism, there's a growing wave among theologians, religious scholars, and religious leaders who are pressing for sustainable, effective dialogue among religions. An increasing number of these religious leaders of thought have rejected exclusivism as unhealthy for interreligious living today. Furthermore, there is a growing call among Christian theologians and religious scholars for the adoption of the theological mindset of inclusive religious pluralism, strongly underscored and advocated for by the Belgian-born Jesuit Jacques Dupuy. Several other Christian scholars like Gerardo Collins, Ramon Panica, Richard Roy, Aloysius Pieris, Wilfred Felix, Terence Merrigan, uh, William Burroughs, Cardinal Franz Conin, Ambrose Monk Inheren, Schubert Miles Ogden, Paul Griff Griffiths, and others. These Christian theologians and religious leaders either expressly endorse inclusive religious pluralism or allude to it in their theology of religion. Inclusive religious pluralism was coined in the Christian circle by Jacques Dupuy as the most appropriate form of pluralism from a Christian perspective. Given its appropriateness for Christianity and aware of the uniqueness of other religious traditions, Dupuy envisaged, and he said, uh, the theology of religions, which was still in its infancy, would have to make a complete turn from a Christian-centered perspective to one centered on the personal dealings of God with humankind throughout the history of salvation. This study is consistent with the roadmap which um, Dupuy had envisaged. Based on the development in Christian theology of religions and the imperatives of inclusive religious pluralism, for other world religions. This study seeks to explore how other world religions can appreciate and implement inclusive religious pluralism worldview from their different religious traditions. 
While a Christian inclusive religious pluralism will have a very strong Christian theological and philosophical nuance, inclusive pluralism in Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, or Buddhism will have theological and philosophical nuances peculiar to Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism respectively. So basically, we and my goal here is not to dump down the Christian concept of inclusive pluralism on other world religions. Each of those world religions need to figure out from um, their theological basis how this um, idea, idea is operable and valid. So imperatively, this work recognizes that inclusive religious pluralism is not an exclusive Christian worldview. It is a theological, philosophical proposition and worldview that can authentically crest in the ambience of any of the world religions today. So in summary, for Christians, the appropriate inclusive pluralism stems from maintaining a Christocentric inclusivism and a pluralism that genuinely respects and appreciates differences. A Buddhist inclusive pluralism will reflect a Dharma-centric inclusivism and genuine respect and appreciation of the differences of the other. An inclusive pluralism from a Jewish, Islamic, or Hindu perspective, we have a theocentric inclusivism with deep appreciation of a pluralism that honors and respects differences of the other. So I will dedicate a chapter on, the, on, on this subject to each of the following religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and then a chapter on Mesoamerica, American Indian and African traditional religions. So this, uh, the selected indigenous religions of this study have some common theological beliefs that are imperative for the advancement of inclusive religious pluralism from their perspectives that are of critical importance to this study. Two of those are the common importance and value attached to the belief of the centrality of the reverence for the earth, which is the preservation of the environment as well as the value and respect for biodiversity. Indigenous religions should be the main drivers in the much needed world religions dialogue for the protection of the environment and biodiversity. Of course, um, Francis, uh, Pope Francis had set that ball rolling in uh, one of his first encyclicals um, to uh, publications to the world. The recent victory of uh, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva over Jair Bolsonaro in the recent presidential election in Brazil is a victory for the human collective needs to protect the Amazon from the greed of capitalism today, uh, which was endorsed by the now outgoing president Bolsonaro, who is a so-called conservative Christian person. Now, buttressing the necessity for, uh, well, besides my, the chapters focusing on this, um, this world religions, uh, I'm also going to look at inclusive religious pluralism uh, as, as an asset in the dialogue of action among world religions. I'm going to look at mystics and how they help us, mystics from across the different religious divides, how they help us articulate and uh, put into practice religious pluralism theology. And I'm also going to look at religious pluralism as an asset for social integration in our 21st century. I will look at interreligious dialogue and the ecclesiocentric evangelization. Uh, my job here is to ask people to um, redefine how evangelization in the, in the postmodern world should be, uh, evangelization that respects the dignity of other religions. Now, buttressing the need for the theology of inclusive religious pluralism toward effective dialogue will explore its philosophical and various theological groundings from different world religions. Because of my faith foundation and in the light of persistent research developments, progressive interpretation of scriptural texts, especially from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism will be referenced. At this point, it is imperative on this subject of scriptural references to inclusive pluralism to affirm the caveat of Perry Schmidt Luko regarding scriptural evidences for exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. And he said, 
Neither explicitly nor implicitly does the Bible endorse just one particular option in the theology of religions. Um, next, next slide, please. However, from the perspective of, uh, yeah, and next slide. Sorry, I think I forgot to tell you on that. However, from the perspective of um, uh, Islam and Hinduism, the scriptures explicitly endorse the authenticity of multiple religions as divine will. Inclusive religious pluralism mindset makes a dialogue among religions indispensable and sustainable. Now to circle back to uh, Hans Kung's statement of the indis indispensability of peace among the religions for peace in the society, he in the same breath also stated that there can be no peace uh, among the religions without dialogue between the religions. Therefore, inclusive religious pluralism mindset makes people of any religious faith tradition positively disposed to appreciate the value and good in other religions and the desire to know further about them. This disposition is key to every successful interreligious dialogue. Next slide. Inclusive religious pluralism as an asset toward interreligious dialogue. In the light of today's theological, social, and cultural developments, the mindset of inclusive pluralism is increasingly appreciated and imperative. These developments not only accentuate the right to exist of our religions, they also make some form of the old approach to evangelization and proselytization both obsolete and disrespectful to the dignity of other religions and the freedom of religion of individuals, which is enshrined today in most modern states. All theologians interested in the development of theology of religions and optimum application of interreligious dialogue are urged to embrace the theology of inclusive religious pluralism because its worldview is indispensable for effective interreligious dialogue uh, relationship and dialogue today. Jacques Dupuy is a Christian in the Christian circle, spent the greater part of the last years of his scholarship promoting and defending inclusive pluralism as the most Christian worthy framework for pursuing meaningful and successful interreligious dialogue between Christians and people of other faith traditions. Mohammed Tal Tal Talbi, Mohammed Ayub, and Fetullah Gulen in the Muslim circle are formidable promoters for Muslims in modern society engaging in healthy dialogue with people of other faith tradition, other faith traditions. Swami Vivekananda and Swami Pravahanandas, an advocate of the doctrine of Ishtadeva in Hinduism, as well as Buddhist scholar J. Abraham Vales de Sia, are all in favor of the kind of dialogue that is re reflective of the worldview of inclusive pluralism. Dupuy's justification for advocating and exploring the theology of inclusive religious pluralism hinge hinges on the facts of the new order of being Christian in our world today. Uh, he specifically points out in, in this quote, today's multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-religious world requires from all parts a qualitative leap proportional to our situation. If we wish to have in the future an open and positive mutual relations between peoples, cultures, and religions of the world, unquote. From the perspective of the several other world religions, especially the theistic religions, an inclusive religious pluralism is indispensable for effective interreligious dialogue. And such inclusive religious pluralism must affirm the centrality of the divine or ultimate reality in the lives of all human beings. Next, uh, next slide. The Christian understanding of inclusive pluralism and the understanding of the term in other world religions are indeed mutually complementary. Underscoring the mutual complementarity of both positions, Dupuy says, it must be shown that whereas inclusive Christocentrism is non-negotiable for Christian theology, it can be combined with a true theocentric pluralism, both aspects being complementary in a single reality. Dialogue, among peoples of the world religions built on the principle of inclusive pluralism can be a major effective and meaningful way of breaking the doldrums of hate 
and heinous acts promoted by exclusivism and rejection of the other, so historically prevalent in parts of the world where religious motivated conflicts and violence are perpetuated. A dialogue pursued from the point of view of inclusive religious pluralism will be truly humane and open to the facts as claimed in Christianity and several other theistic world religions, that we as creatures of divine are all of the same origin and oriented toward the same final end. Therefore, an inclusive, mental, uh, an inclusive mentality enables us to identify and appreciate our commonalities as well as our complementarity. While pluralism encourages us to respect and recognize the authenticity and validity of the other and our differences. Effective dialogue among uh, next slide, please. Among peoples of all the world religions practically ensures a more peaceful world. In addition, an effective and healthy dialogic relationship among people of diverse religions of the world, which is based on inclusive religious pluralism, guarantees admirable and genuine respect for all religions. We all have a moral obligation to recognize not only the authenticity of the humanity of our people, but also the validity of their spirituality and the sources of such spirituality. For the sources of their spirituality are the systems from which they draw a sense of meaning and dignity in life. Through the words of Canon Max Warren, Alan Race iterates the mindset of the average pluralist in this way. Our first task in approaching another people, another culture, another religion is to take off our shoes for the place we are approaching is holy. Else we may find ourselves trading on men's dreams or people's dreams. More serious still, we may forget that God was here before our arrival, unquote. Warren clearly suggests that trading softly and respectfully through the religions of the others is indispensable. Otherwise, we might dishonor them and thus also dishonor their creator, whom we equally hold with reverence as our creator. Next slide. Inclusive religious pluralism uh, affords people of all faith traditions to embrace the common origin and goal of all humans, as well as honor the genuine and spiritual fulfilling mission of all religions. By inclusive religious pluralism, the commonalities we share as human beings are collectively embraced while honoring the dignity and respect of the different spiritual paths, which are the diverse ways human beings continue to search for meaning and spiritual fulfillment. Conclusion. Now the proposition of inclusive plur religious pluralism fulfills the admonishment of a World Council of Churches document, which, is, which identified the need to explore further the plurality of approaches toward establishing and sustaining effective interreligious dialogue between Christians and people of other faith traditions. Our different spiritual paths called religions are symptomatic of the different ways human beings historically have responded to higher calls and ways humans have said to distinguish themselves as creatures who have both temporal and supernatural obligations and identity. Therefore, inclusive pluralism appreciates both our commonalities and differences, holding both as realistic composite truism of whom we intrinsically are and using such balanced appreciation of who we are to forge better dialogue between religious interlocutors. People of all religions are invited to harness the benefits of this appreciation to tread the difficult but necessary path of interfaith dialogue with others of, of different world religions. It must be noted that a dialogue among religions resulting from the worldview of inclusive religious pluralism is sustainable and effective because it is an ongoing and permanent feature of living interreligiously in our post-modern societies. This phenomenon is what Peter Pan describes as being religious interreligiously. Such dialogue must not be occasional or emergency exercises. It needs to be consistently a feature of the existence of all religions in our society. Our next slide. An inclusive pluralist uh, is essentially 
a bridge builder between one's religious tradition and that of the other. As an inclusive pluralist, one comes to the forum, the portal, table, or ambience of dialogue with the satisfaction of the beauty and benefits of the treasures contained in one's religious tradition and willingness to share those with the other while in the same breath being open with the desire to receive the beauties and treasures of the other. An inclusive pluralist does not bracket or minimize power or his traditional values, rather they are adequately endowed with them as they seek to benefit from the encounter with the other. Therefore, the privilege of dialogue provides opportunity to mutually share with the religious other. At the end of the exercise, the inclusive pluralist lives better enriched and satisfied, having generously and satisfactorily endowed her or his interlocutor with the beauties and values of her or his faith tradition and received the beauties and values of the interlocutor. Dialogue becomes an exercise of mutual and reciprocal giving and taking of each other's religious riches and values. Next slide. Pope Francis, and uh, Grand Imam El Tayeb in their declaration, in the declaration they signed at Abu Dhabi in 2019 underscored, dialogue among believers means coming together in the vast peace, space of spiritual, human, and shared social values. And from here, transmitting the highest moral virtues that religions aim for. It is also, it also means avoiding unproductive discussions. Next slide. This major document endorsed by leaders of the two largest religions on our planet underscores that interreligious dialogue should be an exercise that is both ongoing and prevalent in human society. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much for this very interesting, uh, it was a journey around the world and it is, uh, I, it, it, some of it I recognize from earlier studies, uh, other aspects I recognize from uh, contacts that I have from people who I know uh, who are active in, uh, usually in the Christian circles, but uh, also in Islam. And uh, I, uh, I think there is, um, for every single aspect, for every single slide, that uh, we could uh, quite easily fill uh, an entire seminar. Um, I'm also extremely happy that uh, uh, we have found um, a few more um, guests who are participating in this seminar and who, will, uh, who may have questions. So I, I wonder whether... Um, um, there's anybody who would like to start off the discussion? Anybody? <laughs> you can, you should be able to unmute yourselves. One second. Who would like to, you can raise your hand and um, like this, you can, um, you can indicate that you want to speak. Yes, Romina has her hand up. <laughs> I'm happy to start. I know people yes. need some time to warm up. Uh, thank okay. you so much, Marinus. And sorry, are we pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I get thank different pronunciations, but that's great. <laughs> thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, this was very informative uh, and relevant to me because I'm part of the Ginkgo Fellowship. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, it's a fellowship of Christianity and uh, Islamic uh, divine scholars, uh, divinity scholars. And, and what we do, actually, we have fellowship retreats uh, with scholars from Al-Azhar uh, in Cairo, Egypt, um, and UK-based divinity scholars to sort of discuss you know, key questions, I guess, uh, interfaith questions. Um, and one of the, I guess, the, the reasons that make this particular fellowship uh, very effective for all of us included, um, we have had a number of fellowships over, over, over the years, and many of the colleagues who are part of the fellowship, uh, the Muslim colleagues, are very close friends to me. And, you know, we have very in-depth conversations, um, and we've developed these friendships over time. So we have very open, genuine discussions. And one of the things that emerged in the last retreat we did in Cairo um, was that 
what made us really comfortable in this circle of friends, right, because you're not always comfortable when there is difference, um, was that we were not uh, evading the fact that we had differences, uh, interreligious differences, but we actually, so, you know, there is this pretense, which is very much, I think, informed by this political correctness view that uh, all religions are, are similar and we have to sort of see it as similar, especially within Christianity. I come from Eastern Orthodox Christianity, certainly not similar to Roman Catholic or uh, Protestant Christianity. There are fundamental differences. There are also fundamental differences between, um, I would say, uh, Oriental Christianities that I work in. I'm based in Ethiopia, so I work with Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. Um, and so there are differences even within Christianity, right? Let's, that's one difference, but there's also differences across religious uh, religious traditions um, and faiths. And one of the things that seems to have worked uh, very well in this fellowship is that we were honest about the differences and we actually intellectually try to understand these differences theologically, but also as, as um, practitioners of these faiths, right? And we come with this interest of really understanding. Um, so one of the things we concluded at the last fellowship was that we appreciate acknowledging, recognizing the differences and starting with that as a point of entry for discussion. Um, and I just wonder how that lived experience of mine, I guess, uh, feeds into your or aligns with your argument of um, inclusive pluralism. Is, is that correct if I'm, yes, yes. I'm using the right term? So I would just love to connect my lived experience with your uh, argument and and, th and the theoretical frameworks available. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Romina, that's amazing. Um, I would say empirical um, experience. I mean, uh, articulation of the truth of where we find ourselves. Um, unfortunately, because we came most religions of the world, especially Christianity and Islam, those two in particular, we came from a worldview of exclusivism and Christianity for sure. We have always thought we were the only ones and then came to the point where we found out that we were not the only ones. God had other people, I've had other people and still have other people. And so we adopted kind of embrace inclusivism and the concept of inclusivism is that we're all similar. We share a lot of things together. Well, from the Christian perspective is that they share a lot of things together with us and they're eventually gonna assimilate into us and stuff like that. So people are a little bit uncomfortable emphasizing the difference. Now, when pluralism came in, and this is why I, for one, and a lot of scholars and people in your circle, I would reject the kind of pluralism that John Hick promotes. Is the almost drawn from the so-called inclusive mentality that all religions are equal and all religions go to the same direction and all of that. I think it's a false assumption. It's uh, it's uh, uh, it's superimposing your your mind view on other religions. Uh, I try not to get into the concept, the argument of all religions are equal because you can't even measure the, you know, the the, the value of religions without your uh, subjective evaluation. The only one who can come before all of us and say all religions are equal and I will respect that will be God, and none of us is God, and because we are not God. Why would you say all religions, from what perspective are you saying all religions are equal? Uh, I can understand that we can say all religions must be dignified, yes, but equality is not a measure that any of us falls into. So we tend to, uh, for me, pluralism, the major, uh, the major value for pluralism is the acceptance of difference. Um, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Sachs, um, who, who just passed away this uh, this year, uh, wrote the, the great uh, book, which he calls The Dignity of Difference. And it's based on the concept that we are different and we should not shy away from our differences because differences is how we were created by God. That is how we got owned by God. That is what makes our world beautiful. We shouldn't all want to fix, you know, create this, small hole where we force everybody in. We need to embrace that di being different is nothing evil, it's nothing bad, it's just the uniqueness we all share. So yes, and that is actually why I, 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 I and some other scholars have 
tended have used inclusive pluralism as a more appropriate term to express the, the our theological typology of understanding of other religions. Yeah, so I, I, I'm happy to hear that in real life, people are beginning to appreciate that to be different is dignified, is acceptable, and we should not be ashamed of it. Thank you, Marina. It's very, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, both for the question and for the um, uh, explicit answer. Uh, yes, I, I have my own views on this. This is, uh, of course, we, um, if, if we look at Christianity itself, historically, you can see that um, the um, interpretations between the different denominations um, uh, were, were so um, uh, divide, divisive that um, they not just led to um, political problems, conflicts, wars, but genuinely divided whole populations or societies. And this is something that um, we should never forget that if we talk about Christianity, it, it is not one thing. I mean, you mentioned orthodoxy, but uh, you could say the same about uh, um, Catholicism uh, and uh, pro Protestant uh, churches, and then within the Protestant churches, and uh, uh, so it is uh, a um, and it is probably something that also applies to Islam. Uh, I just know two directions that uh, are at log ahead with the, at log aheads with each other. So uh, accepting. Um, differences is the only way that we can actually get, uh, go around this because the differences will not go away. They will, if Absolutely. anything, become more pronounced. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is my input as a non-theologian. So I have, <laughs> I have, yes. Anyway, um, the, I have a question here from in the uh, um, in in writing, and now I have to see whether. Um, uh, yeah, oh yes. So first of all, in uh, order. Uh, we have uh, Charles Coelum, uh, uh, who is saying, uh, how does religious pluralism negotiate the dynamics of hegemony, hegemony that characterizes the concept of supremacy in the binary of religious identity in the us versus them dichotomy? Um, uh, in the us versus them dichotomy seems influenced by the elephant in the room, namely power. So, um, so how, how would you answer this? This is um, uh, the, uh, a binary of religious identity, but actually uh, being influenced by political social power. Yes, um, that is um, that is a sociological um, truth, but because besides the theological understanding of from the theological perspective, I have issues with talking about defining religious pluralism as meaning all religions are equal. Uh, but when you come into the sociological and political parlance, uh, I would not hold the same theological views because uh, theologically, I mean, politically and sociologically, we as individuals, all of us have equal dignity and, and rights before the law. Uh, and so my position on, the, on, on pluralism theologically is not gonna be exactly the same politically and sociologically. Uh, now, he, he's right. The big elephant in the room is power dynamics. And uh, um, from, the, from that perspective, uh, I am more in, in, inclined to accept that the political um, definition of pluralism, because Pluralism has different ways to be understood. Pluralism sociologically, pluralism politically, and pluralism philosophically or theologically. And all three have different um, basic concepts of different approaches. Politically, I'm more inclined to saying that the, 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 the religions in the society must be accorded equal respect and equal dignity. Now, according to equal dignity and equal respect doesn't say anything about the values in the religions. It is not in the place of the politicians or sociologists, some sociologians, uh, sociologists to define the quality of a religion. Um, politically by law, every religion is held, uh, should be held sacred and equal and respected by the law equally. 
Now, on the theological framework, is a different thing because the hub of theology is God. And that's why I say I don't subscribe to seeing the, uh, pluralism as talking about equality because that's not the issue. That's not any of, anything any of us can measure. Politically, you can measure it. You can, for peace in the society, every religion in society should be accorded the same respect. And that way you break the so-called dominance of power by the so-called dominant religious um, um, religions in operation. Uh, because if you do not operate a religious pluralistic mindset politically, we're gonna have problems because those that are dominant will continue to wanna be dominant over others. And that shouldn't be the case politically because the law treats all of us the same. So I, I don't know if I am able to answer that, but pluralism tries to evade the whole thing about us versus them, binary, um, by embracing, again, differences, it, uh, embracing the differences and authenticating the differences, not just embracing them. Um, like I said earlier, pluralism is not just, an, is not just a reality, it's a mindset. That mindset where you accept the, the dignity of the other and the respect the other must be given. Uh, I don't know. That's the much I can say about that. I, I'm not sure. I don't know if I responded to Charles's question uh, appropriately. Yes, Charles, Charles would be able to say, but I'm, uh, yeah, to, to me it was, um, um, it's, it sounds convincing that uh, uh, unless you show respect to the other side, you will not, uh, you will not get a, um, a situation where the, um, where the, the whole community or the communities that are represented in a society, where they will uh, be able to co cooperate with each other and actually uh, uh, respect each other and prevent the other side from being humiliated or actually from being discriminated against. So th this is um, something that is, of course, um, not the case in many societies, but um, uh, it is a way where religious belief can really uh, make a big difference. Um, yes, so thank you very much, Charles. Uh, now, we have a question by Patricia uh, Idoko um, asking, what are some practical ways inclusive, uh, plur inclusive pluralism could be promoted, especially in our education system? Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, the practical ways to my mind would be to honor, teach our students to honor and respect differences, to appreciate differences because differences make us unique. Our world would not be beautiful if it was only female or if it was only male, if it was only, you know, senior guys or um, children. It, it's that complexity of our differences that make our world beautiful. So we, if we can start by encouraging our students to um, embrace and appreciate uh, the dignity of the difference in us, that will emphasize pluralism, but also appreciate that there are a lot of commonalities we share. Even when we are most different, there are still things we share together. Uh, and that those two pr prong principles are necessary in our world today, we talk about inclusivity so strongly, but inclusivity should also be aligned with differences. Accepting that we can all blend, but respecting as we blend the differences within the, I mean, among each of us. Um, I, it may be uh, that for me, uh, inclusive pluralism, even though I find it most appropriate theologically, it's also very uh, appropriate culturally and sociologically because you are able to harmonize both. You're able to harmonize the beauties of inclusivism as well as the beauties of differences of, of plurality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Patricia. I hope that was a satisfactory answer. That was, uh, uh, but. It was again uh, focusing on plurality, uh, which I think is the key for, uh, to uh, resolving um, uh, the the, um, 
the way that prejudice arises at the at an early age, namely in childhood, and uh, the, the, because after all, in a schoolyard, you have the the, the opportunity the, to to get to know each other, and often that, that is uh, not the case. Have we just lost our speaker? No, money, no, sorry, just, no, just by I'm screen. Here. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I have comments here by Romina. I I'm not sure whether Romina would like to express them uh, in in. I, no worries. I'm just having a conversation with the comments that I've read. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I just love uh, love all the points. Uh, just making the comment that um, I think to to uh, respect fully the dignity of the religious other, you first have to be comfortable in your own skin, your own religious identity, mm -hmm. and that happens when you are informed enough to be comfortable, and that takes a bit of uh, education. And yeah. and I think this is what we found in the Ginkgo Fellowship with the with the fellows. We are all informed theologians and we're at a point where we're comfortable in our skin to face the limitations of our faith and have that honest conversation. And the question is, how many people in the wider public who may not have that familiarity and specialization be able to, to, to get to that point where they're comfortable to face the difference, if that makes sense? Sure, sure. I think uh, Frank has his hand yeah. up. Yes, exactly. Frank, Frank, please. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I, uh, I want to say that um, not all religions accept the concept of sin. And it seems to me that that's a pretty key issue um, because it, when you see that, uh, when you introduce that concept, you introduce the notion of religions going wrong. Um, the concept of respect, it seems to me that it's respect the scorpion because you know how to deal with it it's it's not necessarily that that the respect is something that is earned simply by the otherness of the person expressing something different it there is there was um, a man in my tradition ignatius loyola who was a soldier and uh, uh, set up the Jesuits and went off to Paris and, and so on. Uh, and he came up with a phrase which was, it is not to know much that fills and satisfies the soul, but to have tasted deeply. And it seems to me that when one talks about religions in this sort of overarching sense of uh, these big names of these big religions, and after all, there are over 25,000 variants of of Christianity, of course, um, we're, we're talking about a certain sort of um, mad dream of universal peace. And I'm not sure, first of all, how grounded that mad dream is within the theology of our Christianities, um, that it's with differences that we um, learn, that we uh, are incentivized to find different paradigms of meaning, that we're incentivized to recognize the um, enfleshment of our humanity in our, our rootedness, and therefore also our differences in different parts of the world and different contexts. Mm -hmm. Indeed, our differences even within sim the same families. Mm -hmm. And the respect is surely to do with our concept of God as a relational God, of a God who cannot keep to himself. So... I'm not sure at all about even the dream. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Th thank you. Thank you, Frank. This is uh, very frank. <laughs> this is very, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Marinos, what do you have to say to that? Uh, I, I think that's pretty deep, Frank. Uh, but the one point I, I know when you say not all religions have a concept of sin, hmm. I know the it depends on how you define sin. Uh, if you're using a Christian definition of sin, of course, you're going to miss out the Buddhists, you're going to miss out the Jainists, Jain, the Jains, 
you are going to miss out. It, I find the, the Japanese religion or Shintoism not dwelling so much on sin, but then there's rightness and wrongness in their culture, in their religion. Um, as I say, I've never seen a culture as pure, you know, materially pure, practically pure as the Shinto culture where they want to keep everything clean and pure. It's like they're germaphobes by birth, you know, by in their gene. Uh, and so for them, when you, you do not keep cleanliness, that is considered evil or that's considered wrong. So I guess, I guess my point is, depends on how you define sin. If you're using a Christian definition of sin, you're gonna lose out some people because they may not see that in, in the same light. But I, I know for sure that every culture, every religion has a sense of what is wrong and what is right, if we can use that term. Um, and uh, again, um, I, I appreciate your, your reflection on um, Loyola's um, idea. It's not so much about how much you know, but the impact of the things you've learned. Um, uh, the 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 simple thing, my simple explanation. This is why our wider world today helps us to appreciate differences. I appreciate that the world doesn't end with me, um, uh, and to recognize that people who are different require the same dignity and respect as I do. Uh, those of us who travel, I think it is very obvious to all of us because once you leave your dominant space. You are vulnerable as it is, wherever you find yourself. I know you land in a different culture. You might be a king or whatever, where you, wherever you are from, but certainly not in that world. You have to be susceptible to their rules and ways of looking at things. And all of a sudden you become almost a nobody, so to speak. I, I found it, especially for those of us raised with the so-called so English language, we have this weakness of not being able to speak in other world languages. And typically, if anybody came to me from, I don't know, Japan or, France or, or China or wherever, I can't speak English. I, there's this concept that they are, um, I don't know, they're not educated, which is not true. And then I found myself in a Spanish word where I can't speak English. And because I couldn't speak a word in Spanish, it sounded like I was uneducated. <laughs> so, you know, when you leave your comfort zone and encounter the other, it, there's a humbleness you embrace because you now know that you're not the center of the world anymore. Forget about the imperial world back in the days when the colonial people had that influence. That is, of course, have broken down. And now even the smallest, smallest society wants to be recognized for who they are. And we should grant them that the same way we want to be granted that. That's granted my own respect. Um, I don't know if I, I, I think um, Frank was talking to all of us and mm -hmm. basically um, making this very, very powerful observation. I appreciate that, Frank. Yes, uh, Frank, this is actually something that I uh, re remember from the, my very, <laughs> My my very earliest contact with uh, with the, the Christian faith it's um, um, where, where who is a um, who is part of the, um, the, the the holy people who is um, who who is um, included in God's covenant and uh, and there you already get very uh, uh, I I mean it, since you talk about uh, Loyola um, who I respect. Uh, very much, and who I have studied inside out, um, and whose uh, uh, practices I've also followed um, in the pr Protestant circles where I come from. Um, uh, the, in the very beginning, there are people who believe that all uh, Roman Catholics are condemned to permanent uh, hellfire <laughs> because uh, they are <laughs> simply not Christians. So th this is uh, th there. There is uh, there are boundaries which are cl clearly drawn by. Uh, by, by something which uh, you know, which um, it escapes the very concept of pluralism. This, but I do get your point that um, uh, if we paint a picture that uh, that 
essentially everything is beautifully gray, <laughs> that all the colors can be blended, and that that we uh, that we arrive at a uh, a beautiful image which is uh, perfect and where everybody is included. Uh, this does not exist. This is something that is uh, a, um, uh, a, a, a an ideal, uh, which maybe will never be attained. It's uh, but but it's some it's still an ideal that we should try to uphold. Um, and of course, you, you are also right in saying that there are some cultures where the willingness to absorb to accept other cultures might not be there. Uh, sorry, religions where the willingness to accept other religions might not be there uh, for reasons of self-preservation or because they are minorities, they're small uh, religions, or uh, because they are uh, in a temporary state of um, uh, exclusivity where they uh, just make this point very strongly that they are different. So this is there. And uh, and then the final point, and then I shut up forever, is uh, where, where in those places where I studied and where I got to know um, uh, theologians, they had one saying that theologians were always uh, separated by the, the the greatest wall of China that is possible uh, from uh, uh, those who study religions. So study of religions is not the same as theology. Yeah, the two yeah, are completely yeah. separate because <laughs> they uh, because the way of thinking th that you get on one side is very different from th the other side. So so I uh, very much welcome this session where you have theological uh, students of religion, so to speak, because this is very rare. So, okay. but now I'll be quiet. So, if I've I've had a few more emails from uh, people who could not come in, so I I just um, th that was very annoying. But I um I, oh people I wonder is any because we have just a few more minutes to add to this. Marinos, do you have oh, any? Oh, um, sorry, you were you broke up a little bit oh, there. I'm very sorry. Yes, yeah. no. Uh, if, since we are nearing the end of today's sure. session, uh, is there anybody who would like to say something? Or Marinos, would you like to conclude this in a in your own way? I'm happy to to conclude if no one else has anything yes. else to say. Yes, please. Um, I, I oh, want to say- Charles, we have Charles. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So I, I've just been thinking, um, um, I don't know if I'm right, but maybe Frank was actually uh, um, presenting a premise that we should, uh, that we should avoid the fallacy of oversimplification. That's true. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's just what I want to say. And and thanks, Dr. Marinus, for your presentation. This is awesome. Okay. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I that is actually why I'm more comfortable with inclusive pluralism than pluralism, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, uh, pluralism has been hijacked and oversimplified, and uh, people have tended to interpret it in different ways. I feel a lot more comfortable with the hybridity because it gives you the, the, the ability to wiggle through the uniqueness of mm -hmm. religions that we find across the world. Um, yeah, so I, I, I appreciate you all for taking the time to come. I know you made a lot of accommodations for me, first of all, we are holding it at a time that's not usually your time. You know, you you, you give that accommodation. Secondly, we are at a time when virtually nobody is around because everybody's. I just got an email from someone who couldn't make it because she was heading to the airport and all of that. So I understand. I appreciate, but more importantly, I appreciate Soros for uh, welcoming me to share my thoughts on this, and I hope I can. Uh, I'm open to further conversations with scholars on this uh, topic, uh, and as I as I negotiate with my publisher, hopefully we can further share thoughts and uh, 
bring something to reach our fields of um, religion and theology and philosophy, as the case may be. So thank you all for your time. And, and thank you, Lars, for, yes. and Romina, for putting the, making all efforts to make sure this goes through. Yes, thank, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. And um, well done for getting through the, uh, the SOAS Zoom <laughs> firewall. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, th those of you who celebrate Christmas now uh, and ha have a very beautiful Christmas season. And uh, Happy New Year. And uh, we'll be back uh, in uh, January, in the third week of January, I think, with uh, the next uh, seminar, lunchtime seminar. And from that point onwards, we will, um, of course, we will keep all of you informed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marinos, yeah. as well. Thank you, Romina. Thank bye you, bye. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy bye the bye. holiday. Thank you for recording it, too. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, yeah. The recording will be on the YouTube channel uh, with some, yeah. maybe with some delay because it's the holidays. Yeah, sure. Lars. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Thanks everyone. to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye.